Today is Communion Sunday for us. We celebrate on the first Sunday of every month. Uh, the only thing in the United Methodist Church we ask is that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all that love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, friends. Gracious, Gracious God, God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. In, in your, your compassion, compassion forgive, forgive us our sins known and unknown. Those, Those things done and left undone, undone, our actions without love, <laughs> our reactions without thought, our failure to forgive and hurtful words said no. and helpful words unsaid, tasks unfinished and hopes unfulfilled. God of generosity, forgive, forgive us to lay down our burden of regret. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven people. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, so we haven't done this in a while, but in a few minutes, I'm going to invite the ushers to come up <coughs> or collect the offering. We've been uh, struggling to get back to normal, so we're, this is our sense of normalcy today. Uh, I will invite the ushers to come up and they will pass the offering plates. It won't be a big job. We don't have a lot of people here today, but uh, we're going to practice and we're going to get back to doing the stuff that we're used to doing. So at this time, I would invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. And we'll get to hear Ann play something for the offertory. Isn't that great? Let's pray. Gracious God, we, we know that all of the work we do at the church, we do for you. We know that whatever gifts and tithes and offerings we offer are given for the glory of God to do the work of the kingdom. So today, accept our gifts. Take them and use them to do the ministry of the gospel in this community and throughout the whole world. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. as you're able, would you stand for the reading of the Gospel? The Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest upon that person. But if not, it will return to you. <coughs> Remain in the same house eating and drinking, whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and, in, and people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick. 
who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Well, whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your dust of your town that clings to my feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects me, rejects you, rejects me, and whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. These two scriptures fit together in a lot of different ways. I, I love the Galatians passage when it reminds us that sometimes we think we're better than other people. And even the Luke passage reminds us that to do the work of God, we don't have to have a seminary education. We don't have to be equipped in any special way. When Jesus sent out the, the 70, he sent them out with nothing. We have work to do in the kingdom. <coughs> and sometimes we find lots of obstacles in doing it. During this summer season, there seems to be a lack of things that I want to watch on TV. I don't know about you. I'm tired of the news. I'm tired of the weather. It, they promise us rain and we don't get much. Uh, and, 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 so, and then everything else is a rerun that we've already seen. So we have resorted to watching the Grit Channel. I don't know if anybody watches the Grit Channel. It's a lot of old westerns. One of my favorite ones is, a, is one called <coughs> Tombstone Territory. It has really only two main characters, the editor of the Tombstone Epitaph and a guy that's the sheriff, his name is Clay Hollister. Now he's a, he's a good gunman. He, he wears two guns and if, if he gets shot in his left arm, he can draw with his left, with his other arm and whatever, he can, he can do it. He can, he can win every battle. And everybody knows that they know him about it. He's just really good. And it doesn't matter how good the bad guy is, he's not unwilling to go up there. But when he knows it's not a fair fight, that the person he's going up against is going to lose, he has an interesting way of instead of sitting there ready to draw, he just crosses his arms. Can't make any mistake that he's drawing if he crosses his arms. He just stands there and they say, draw, and he says, I'm not going to draw. And, and it reminded me in some ways of these scriptures when maybe what we need to do is pay attention and listen and just be there sometimes and not always respond in anger or hostility. Maybe sometimes we just need to cross our arms and say, I'm not going to play your game today. I'm not going to get into an argument or a dispute with you. I'm just going to love you. What would it be like? How much better would your day be if you didn't have to worry about something you might have wished you didn't say later? Anybody ever done that? Yep. You respond to something and wish you wouldn't have said it? Uh, maybe I'm the only one, but uh, but you know, there's just so many times that if you just don't say anything, maybe that, that it's a good thing. Years ago, when I was first in AA, I was uh, more closely acquainted than I am now with Thomas Henderson. Thomas used to play for the Cowboys. Uh, we're still friends on Facebook, but I haven't talked to him in person in a long time. And one of the things Thomas taught me was sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. And I think that's what's demonstrated by that thing in that show where everything is about gunplay and he just crosses his arms. There is moral stuff to learn in these old shows though. We were watching one yesterday with uh, Dale Robertson. He's famous for the Tales of the Wells Fargo, but he was in another show. He was a judge. He had been a fast gun early in his life. He had been one of those guys that had, had shot people and won. And, and, and at one point in the, in the story, they attribute tons, or maybe not tons, but a number of widows that were left by him because he shot the woman's husband or lover or whatever. Well, they're in a trial, and, and in this trial, it's like you see on TV, you know, if you watch Perry Mason or some of those other shows, the prosecution presents their story, the defense presents their story, after they're done, the, their witnesses, after they're done, the prosecution tells what he thinks you ought to decide if you're on the jury, the defense tells what he ought to decide, 
And usually that's where it ends. It goes to the jury. But this day, the judge said, some of the people that testified to here today, you may not, he told this to the jury, you may not pay attention to them because they're stationed in life. This one person that testified worked in a saloon because her husband was killed in a gunfight. This is back in the old days. She had nowhere else to work. Women weren't important in those days. They couldn't own land. They didn't have anything. And so if a woman was left as a widow, where did she turn? And he said, you may be inclined to ignore her testimony because of her job. But truth is still truth. I want to I use that example just a little bit when we talk about these scriptures today. How many times do we not pay attention to somebody because of their station in life? I want to tell you, God didn't create us at different. Some of us have more money than others. Some of us are more successful than others. But nobody is of less value to God. Everybody is of the same value to God. Amen. And if we don't treat people with that, then are we really doing what Jesus has called us to do to go out and minister to the gospel? It's real easy to pick and choose and say, well, their, their testimony, their understanding, their explanation, their political beliefs are not valid because of something they've done. But you know what? God didn't make any junk. Amen. Everybody has value. And if I read these scriptures the way I read them, and I hope you do too, God is calling me to treat people with that same fairness. Jesus, who did he hang out with? He hung out with the unwanted, the demon, the demon possessed, the lepers. He didn't hang out with just the good guys. He hung out with everybody because there's always a hope that, that we have a, a God of redemption. We live in a society right now because somebody's been in jail or in prison. We lower their standard of, uh, we, don't, we don't want to take what they have to say. Maybe they did what they did. Maybe they paid their dues. Maybe their dues have been paid. Isn't it time that we could maybe give them a chance to be redeemed? God calls on us to be people of the gospel. And the gospel is a book, a set of teachings about redemption. I believe in a God that can turn somebody's life around. How about you? Amen. I believe in a God that can transform people from what they were to what God wants them to be. Yep. I remember back thinking about that, you know, during Watergate. I think it's been 50 years ago. James Coulson was one of the one of the lawyers that went to prison. He didn't say he didn't deserve to be in prison. <coughs> But while he was in prison, he began to think about the things he knew, what he believed, what he could do. And you know what he did? He started prison ministries. I'm not saying God sent him to prison so he could start prison ministries, but because he was in prison, he had the opportunity to start prison ministries. And in our church, we participated in it every year when we do angel tree, we provide gifts for parents, for kids whose parents are incarcerated. So many times we look and say, well, they're the way they are. I, this last week I, I uh, had an experience, I guess you would call it. I uh, walked around behind the building and I found a, a shopping cart and a baby buggy and a bunch of unwashed dishes and stuff. And I was curious, uh, as, as I think it says somewhere in one of the uh, uh, children's stories, it was curiouser and curiouser. And so I walked around the building and I found a, a young lady and a young man over here behind the fellowship hall and she was taking a bath. I mean, she had her hair lathered up with shampoo. I mean, this was not just a, I'm going to wash my hands thing. And I said, what are you doing? And, and I said, it's obvious to me you've been living back here. There's dirty clothes, and dirty shoes, and dirty dishes. And she, well, you know, we have to clean up. I said, well, how did you turn the water on? Because we didn't have a faucet on it. And the guy get out his wrench. He said, well, I, I got a wrench. I can turn everybody's water off. And I said, well, you know, I was here. I'm here. We have a bell on the door. If you'd have asked, you could have used any of our facilities. But instead, you snuck around behind here and you've been sleeping and living back here. That's not healthy. I'm not judging those people. I'm really not. I have compassion for them. I know it's a pain in the behind to be homeless and not have a place to go. But I also drive around town and every single place I pass is hiring. We were, Kathy and I went to a restaurant. This is my advertisement. 
It's called Joe Lee's. It's down in Kima. If you've never been there, they got pretty good food. <laughs> we were there, and the, the, the manager said, I'm the only one here. You don't need a number. I'll find you when your food's ready. Meanwhile, there's a young lady sitting at a table filling out an application. She had the occasion then to sit down with the manager. And the manager, we could hear every question she asked. Why'd you leave your last job? You know, all the stuff you could ask. <coughs> and she said, well, here's the deal. If you want the job, you got it. We pay $9 an hour for a server. Now, I have it on good authority. That's high. Most places are paying $3. They are nine plus tips. She said, I really think you want the job. I really think you're going to be back, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to give you a uniform shirt until you show up tomorrow morning. She came by our table after because we cheered when she hired the lady. And we told her when she's coming back, we think she'll be back. She was a nice young lady. Looked like she needed a job. And I heard the manager say, I'll work around your college schedule. I'll work with you in any way I can. I need people to work. And if you're willing to work, we're going to treat you right. i got to tell you that I don't go past any place that's not hiring somebody. I mean, even moments is hiring. <laughs> For all positions. I'm not sure what that means. Oh my. I've thought about it a little bit. But I can't figure it out. <laughs> it says pretty clear to me in here you reap what you sow if you're only looking for the flesh things bigger cars, more money, fancier houses you're going to be subject to the economy and everything else, right? if you're looking for spiritual things we already have the answer, don't we? the answer is from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we've been given the promise what are we going to do with it? Some people are just naturally spiritual. Somebody asked me earlier, why, who in the world would have put these beautiful flowers up here for Jeannie Peterson said? I love all of y'all, but there was one lady I knew who it was the minute I saw her. I'm not going to embarrass you by saying who it is, but I knew who it was. And I know why, because that person demonstrates everything I want to be in a Christian. Amen. She demonstrates love and mercy and grace. And compassion for everyone. Amen. You know, how do you get that? Well, you work at it. It's not necessarily natural. Sometimes it's easier to be judgmental and say, well, they're at a lesser place than me. Jesus addresses it. Remember when he says, if you think you're important and you sit in the front, don't sit there because somebody else more important might come in. If we want to decide on how people's worth by their monetary status, their job in the in life, their place in life, or the size house they have, or what color car they drive, we're missing the point. When we started the food box outside during COVID, we had a lot of skepticism about it because we're people. We thought somebody would come along and clean it out every day. We thought somebody would steal the whole box. Although we glued it down pretty good. I'm not sure they could take the box. I ran into a lady out there one day. She was driving a pretty new car. This is right at the beginning of the lockdown. And she said, have you got a minute? I said, yeah. She said, I want to tell you how grateful we are for what you're doing. She said, we're not homeless. We had a pretty good job. I was an aide up at the school. My husband was a handyman. He was doing work all around the community. But when the kids didn't come back to school, they didn't need any aids. And they laid us off. And when COVID happened, people didn't want handymen in their house. And my husband couldn't work. And we still had to make a house note. We still had to make, a, you know, a car payment. And she said, because of the food you provided us out here, we were able to keep doing that stuff. You see, that kind of compassion, it's so easy to judge and say, those people coming through that line, they're just people that are freeloaders <coughs> and taking advantage. But you never know, do you? Amen. And so our task isn't to judge and decide who's worth it and who not. It's the reason I like our ministry there so much better than some others. We don't ask people what zip code they're from. We don't ask people if they have a job. We don't ask any questions. The sign says pretty plainly, if you need it, take it. And if you can leave something, do so. And I have met a number of people that tell me, 
up here at, at uh, Sudi's when we go to eat there, one of the waitresses said, I haven't been by, the, and she doesn't go to church here. She said, I haven't been by the church in a while. i got to bring some food. People up at the other, other places in town are bringing food. Some people are actually collect, collecting food for their uh, food drives, and they're giving it to us to put in over here. It's become a community resource. If the reason the government gives us tax-free status is so we can provide services to the community. I'm not worried about them taking it away as long as we do God's work. These sometimes sound like political talks. They are not political talks. This is simply a talk about what the gospel says. Love others as Jesus loved you. And how much was that? He gave his life for you. Love your neighbor. You know, in the old days, neighbors meant the person lived on your left or your right. Across the street. Now who's our neighbor? I mean, we have neighbors in Ukraine that we're helping right now, right? We're considering them neighbors and we're helping them to hang on and do what they're doing. And because we're United Methodists, we're actually providing that service through our connectional giving where we are giving money through UMCOR and UMCOR is there and we are making a difference in the world. Now, we're not doing it so we can gloat about it like the scripture says and say, oh, we're doing the right thing. We're doing it because we believe Jesus is capable of transforming the world. Y'all believe that, don't you? Yeah. That Jesus can transform the world. Amen. Now, the question is, does the world need transforming? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But has it, is that a new thing? No. Has the world always needed transforming? God thought so much about transformation that He sent Jesus Christ to be God with flesh on that we could see walking around and showing us what love and mercy and grace look like. The question is, how do we stay connected to that power? And, and to me, that's the big challenge. And, and I'm, I'm wrestling with it every day right now. As you look around and you see all those people that... You, you don't remember this maybe, but I'll refresh your memory. Pre previous to COVID... Our average attendance on Sundays was somewhere between 60 and 90. It varied. It was 60, 65, 70. Our average attendance on Saturday night was between 20 and 40. We were having an average of 120 people in church every week. 126, I think. We're struggling to do half that right now. Don't feel alone. I, I talked to the, and we were at a wedding the other day, I talked to the senior pastor at Moody Memorial United Methodist down in Galveston. They're running 50%. I talked to another neighbor church over here. They're running 25%. We're holding our own with about 50%. So what's different? Well, I don't know whether people got out of the habit or whether this isn't feeding anything that they needed in their soul. I don't know what the difference is, but we're struggling to get everybody back. Now, what I know is sometimes it's easier to get new people than it is to get old people to come back. Sometimes habits get so strong. We had, uh, two weeks ago, we had 25 people watch our service online. And I don't think that's too many of you that are here watching it. I think it's people that weren't here. I keep track of that, and they let us track that as attendance right now. But let me tell you, if you're not here, you miss out on the community. You miss out on somebody saying, oh, we're glad you're back from vacation, or we're sorry you've been sick. You miss out on the beautiful flowers that remind us of a soul that was here every week when she could be day after day she came in with her walker she struggled to get here but being here was important i remember when mac and are they okay I'm this afternoon. okay well when mac and them first started coming i remember this so well uh ronnie came up to me before church and said uh, would you take communion to mac because it's hard for him to get up i said oh i'd be happy to and then uh, one of our other members that sometimes uses a walker or, or crutches came up for communion and his statement was, if she can go, I can go. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm talking about when I say community. Sometimes we need to know that somebody else has struggled through the hard times. Somebody else got up this morning hurt, but they came to church anyway. Somebody else had struggles in their life. Things didn't go well for them last week, but they came here because the community makes them stronger. So the question is, how do we share that news? Well, we all go different places. We don't hang out in the same spots. Once in a great while, we may see each other in Kroger. But we don't really go to the same places much. We hang out in different places. 
when is the last time that instead of, of getting ready for a fight with somebody, you just put your arms together and listened and loved them? When's the last time that somebody said something to you about, I don't know how you made it through. They said, man, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have. And, and I want you to know God loves you too. When, when was the last time we actually shared our experience, our strength, our love for God outside of the people we always see? Yeah, I'm talking about the guy at the gas station if you go inside or, or the, the checker at Kroger or HEB. I mean, we can, it doesn't take much to just say, God loves you when you get ready to leave. We're not trying to necessarily say God loves you only if you come to Hope Community Church. We're saying no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done in your life, God still loves you and God is chasing after you and God is hoping that your life will be transformed. At least I hope that, don't you? I mean, I would love for people to feel the power, to be connected to the power. And if we're connected to it and we do it with a smile and gentleness and mercy and compassion, some days my compassion is better than others. How about yours? Yep. Some days my ability to love across those fences and borders and, and, and uh, lifestyles, some days it's better than others. But my prayer is that every day is better than it was the day before. <clears throat> every day I do a little bit better at being what God called me to be than I used to. <clears throat> we don't live in a vacuum. And I don't believe we can fully experience the love of Christ unless we get into community with each other. And it's when we do that that I think we go out of here and we actually are tempted to sing, if you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. <laughs> we used to, you know, we started that for a while. I would start every service with, you know, how are you? And, and, and Bishop Jones said it one time, he said, I found out that, that the easiest way for me in these troubled times is just to answer, I'm joyful. I gotta tell you something about that. If you practice it, you'll find it's hard to say you're joyful with a frown on your face. He said, and I agree, sometimes you don't feel joyful. Well, what's the point of not saying you're joyful? If it makes you feel a little better, if you're actually working on these things that the Apostle Paul said to be accountable for your own stuff, it's only nobody, no matter how much you love somebody else, how much they love you, nobody can take you through the pearly gate except yourself. Amen. You make that decision, you go there on your own. I hate to tell you this, you can't drag your spouse, you can't drag your wife, your ex-husband, your current husband, your current wife, you can't drag your children there. Only that can be done by you in your own heart. John Wesley would have started most conversations with you with what's the state of your soul. Well, that's a deep question, isn't it? What's the state of your soul? When I went up for ordination, they asked me, they said the first question they asked me, what's the state of your salvation? You know, the easy answer to that is I know I've been saved. My answer was, I'm still working it out. Because day by day by day, I have to continue to challenge myself to be better today than I was yesterday. To pay more attention to the gospel than I did before. To change the way I react or respond. There's a huge difference in those two things. I learned years ago, there's sometimes you just don't know what to say. You ever have those times when somebody starts telling you you don't know what to say? Let me tell you, the best place to go is the ozone. They tell you how they are and you say, oh. Or maybe you could say, oh. Or maybe you say, oh. <laughs> oh, it's a great response. But it doesn't create argument or dissension or disparity. I got to tell you, I think God is calling Christians, not just Methodists, Christians to be the people right now that are a part of this transformation. I believe there's enough of us to do it. But so many times the church, not ours, the church, the big C church has become a place where we're ready to point out somebody else's failures. My uh, third grade school teacher used to get on us when we pointed our finger. You might have had this teaching too. She said, you point your finger at somebody, you're pointing three back at yourself. 
Maybe we need to do some self-work. Maybe we need to look at who we are and how we respond rather than look at the way other people's life is messed up. I know because I raised two boys, a large part of it by myself, that many of their faults are because I gave them to them. Many of the things they do that are... Uh, they either did it in reaction or in response to what their dad taught them. Many years ago, I was sitting in my office at the other church and the senior pastor came in and he said, uh, have you noticed that my daughter can be a smart aleck? And I said, where do you reckon she learned that? He said, I'm going back to my office. <coughs> we make an impression. We have an impact. Sometimes we don't get to see the result. You may tell somebody God loves you. It may not have any impact on that, that, that day, but something may go wrong with them later in the day and they may realize that that person told me they meant it. They say, it sounded like they meant it. That maybe it's true that God really loves me. Maybe when things go south for them, they will turn back to God. In today's world, maybe they'll turn to God for the first time. I don't think people are really as mean as they seem to be. They just are oblivious to what God's trying to do in the world. And I think somebody's got to be the ones to show them. So it's my prayer that we as a community gather together and try to be ministers of the gospel everything we do. The people we hang out with, the people we help, do it without expecting reward. And if they accept it, be happy about it. And if they don't, we might want to use these words. Friend, you may not realize it, but the kingdom of God has come near. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Friends, as you're able, would you please stand? Take this opportunity to offer signs of peace and reconciliation to each other here in the church. Offer the peace of Christ.
be seated. Today our nickel diamond quarter offering up here at the communion table goes for peace with justice ministries within the United Methodist Church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and, gave, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn together. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim relief to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate the sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, <coughs> delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. <coughs> at his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread. Giving it to his disciples, he said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples. He said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. 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 When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we offer the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Friends, the table is prepared. I would invite you to come. There's always room at the prayer rails if you choose to pray. You're invited to come to this place where heaven and earth meet. Come as you will. <laughs>
Friends, we've, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. We've experienced the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And now as we close our service, I invite you to stand as we sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Okay. Mm -hmm. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, God, have a great holiday. Have a safe Fourth of July. God bless. Amen. 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 Amen.